Um, so yeah, my name's Logan. Uh, I actually come from a synthetic biology background, um, but I got into connectomics and whole brain emulation stuff during undergrad, and I'm currently working on gene therapy research for my PhD, um, but I still love this stuff. And so um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a idea that I've proposed um, to various people and I've gotten some support for, um, but not as much as maybe I would like yet. So that'll be part of my ask, um, which is essentially this concept of expansion X-ray microscopy as one of those flashy new technologies that may be able to image the brain much faster than anything else. Um, and so, uh, as we heard from Kenneth or Ken, um, it, so electron microscopy can be good. There can be some potential, um, some potential uh, there for maybe the mouse brain, um, but. Uh, at least if we take very current numbers um, based on this, uh, this six serial section electron microscope data set from Yin et al., it would actually take 600,000 years to map a human brain using just that setup. Um, of course, uh, there, are a lot of, um, there are a lot of caveats to that that I won't go into right now, but I just want to say that, I mean, EM relative to x-ray is very, very slow. And also, I, I don't really have time to go into uh, uh, light sheet, but relative to x-ray, light sheet tends to be pretty slow too. Um, and I come, up with, I, I come up with some very disturbingly long thousands of years kinds of timelines when I plug in light sheet numbers as well. Um, to be fair, people can make arguments about the nuances of that, and, and, and I do think some of those arguments may be valid, but um, there's a debate to be had for sure. Uh, so I'd like to introduce synchrotron X-ray microscopy, which basically you need, um, the, the big drawback is that you need a synchrotron facility um, to do this. Uh, and then you need a beam line within the synchrotron facility, uh, which is essentially that um, sort of sticky outy bit there. Each synchrotron facility has a bunch of beam lines dedicated to different things, and um, imaging, X-ray imaging, is one of them, typically. Um, there's usually several different ones for different subspecialties. Some of the advantages of X-ray imaging, uh, X-ray microtomography or nanotomography, is that it's non-destructive, um, largely speaking. Uh, you don't have to slice up the tissue very much, um, and you certainly don't have to slice it at the nanoscale, maybe at the centimeter scale. Um, it's very fast, um, so with optimization, it might be possible to image a cylinder with a total volume of 20 millimeters approximately uh, at 300 nan nanometer voxel size in 10 seconds. Um, there's a lot that goes into this, but um, again, I have sort of limited time here, so I can't explain all the technical details. But, I mean, you hear 300 nanometer voxel size, that's not really sufficient for nanoscale tech connectomics. And that's where, um, that's where expansion microscopy comes in. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, expansion microscopy involves physically enlarging the sample using a swellable hydrogel. Um, different methods can achieve different expansion factors, 4x, 10x, 20x, even 25x, I've heard from PAN-EXM. Uh, some of the newer methods can label membranes. Um, so Magnify is one of the ones that seems especially promising. Um, and uh, a lot of the expansion technologies make the tissue very fragile, a lot of the older ones. Some of the newer ones can make it um, a lot more stable. Uh, so Magnify, again, is one of those. Pan-EXM -E is another one of those. Um, uh, what I've seen with the older techniques is that the hydrogel almost like falls apart in your hands. Apparently, with the newer ones, that's not the case. However, as I will go into subsequently, there still are some concerns there. But first, I'd like to talk about contrast. Because when you do X-ray microscopy, um, I actually tried this uh, with a laboratory-scale X-ray microscope during undergrad um, and heavy metal staining. Uh, when you combine X-ray microscopy and expansion microscopy, uh, it dilutes everything. And the X-rays need there to be some, some, something to provide contrast. And so I, I think that this recently published preprint by Anz Massad and colleagues is sort of the missing link for this technology to really begin development. Uh, unclearing, unclearing, tissue unclearing is what it's called. This is the missing link. And essentially what it does is you link um, horseradish peroxidase to 
all the primary am amines on um, in tissue sample, which basically means almost everything gets labeled. And then it catalyzes the filling in of, um, uh, of something that can provide contrast, be it silver, <coughs> be it diamines or benzidine, whatever, in a, in a way that really um, sort of replenishes the missing substance there. Um, because it's, it's actually one of the fastest enzymes out there. Um, and what it does it'll, is it can reduce silver, it can reduce diamines or benzidine through, um, through production of hydrogen peroxide. And this reduction just happens super fast because it's such a powerful enzyme. And um, so it can, it can essentially rebuild the tissue that's been stretched apart. Um, at, at least in, 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 in theory. And, and in the preprint that they showed, um, there's some s images at the nanoscale as well that aren't shown here, but it seems very promising to me. Um, the other big, big engineering issue for this, and I think the more challenging one, honestly, is that the um, particularly hydrated samples are very fragile. And uh, even the newer techniques can make them can make them essentially uh, uh, whoops, fall apart. Uh, the synchrotron radiation is very intense, and it would make them probably still make them fall apart if you image for any significant length of time. So, but there might be ways to re-embed the tissue. There might be ways to uh, rapidly photo cross-link the tissue to replace the water with something else that acts similarly without too much shrinkage, et cetera. Um, and there might also be ways to section it into centimeter scale um, samples such that you wouldn't have to image any particular part of it for very long. Um, this is the proposed workflow expansion, unclearing, and stabilization. Um, and this is my last thing. Um, uh, this is a little technical, but uh, our synchrotron's really fast enough. And this is what I think really is important, is that they are really fast. Um, so if you have uh, multi-layer monochromators, um, you can get 10 to the 12 photons per second or more as a flux. Um, and based on this model from Du et al., um, which the equation that's sort of central is displayed up there, and then the plot, um, you should be able to image at, um, at 4x expansion, 300 nanometer actual voxel size, 75 nanometer effective voxel size in 10 seconds um, for these uh, volumes. And I could go into a lot more detail here, but I know I have some somewhat limited time. And so I'll just uh, leave it at that and people can ask questions later if they'd like. Essentially what this equates to is a, a little over a year of continuous imaging for a single, um, a single beam line at a synchrotron um, that is sort of highly optimized for this purpose. And that's an entire human brain, not just a mouse brain. Um, and then, yeah, you can see there's some assumptions built into my model that we can discuss at length later. Um, finally, I'll just say that new synchrotron beamlines typically cost on the order of $10 million. Um, I would imagine it is going to be similar for a connectomics beamline. But the really nice thing about this is that you don't really have to parallelize that much. You could probably do a single human brain in a reasonable time frame, like I said, about a year for um, this single, essentially the single instrument built into this larger facility. And so with that, I will conclude my talk and ask for questions. I want to stop. <laughs> Robert. So, so the 75 nanometers, like if you take um, FIBSIM data and blur it artificially, yep. that is, is definitely not enough to do tracing. Right. Um, uh, I've determined that Probably the minimum you can get away with somewhere is somewhere between 16 and like 22 mm -hmm. yeah. nanometers or so. Um, and so, uh, does that like present like a major problem, or is it like just expand it bigger and take longer? To you do? could just expand it bigger and take longer. Um, there's also some potential that you could get better contrast depending on how well you could optimize the unclearing um, and how well you could uh, engineer your synchrotron optics. And then finally, um, there's. Uh, depending on how far you take this, um, how seriously you take this plot, uh, you could potentially get down to, uh, you could potentially get down to 20 nanometer effective voxel size, even with just 4x expansion, if all the assumptions built into this plot really are true. Um, and so in practice, from what I've seen in the published literature, and mind you, these are academic research groups that have sort of small scale projects, it, it, it's not quite as good as this, but from a theoretical standpoint, it should be possible to 
get to this level. And so, I mean, if you look at like the, I, 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 think, I think the smallest was um, 80 on this, yeah, 80 nanometers um, actual voxel size. 4x, that would be 20. Um, so I mean, th there's a, some wiggle room here. And I think when you actually would develop something like this for real, there would be a lot of possible ways to sort of wiggle your way into getting better and better results. And the and I think the sky's really the limit in, in many ways if you have sufficient resources to develop this in an optimal way. What's your challenge? My challenge um, is, the, I want to focus on sample stabilization because I think that's going to be one of the most difficult parts of this. My challenge is how do we take a expanded um, a hydrated tissue sample and just remove the water without it shrinking back down, maybe replace the water with something, and then just lock it into place with something really nice and stable. Oh, yes, okay. How do we stabilize expanded tissue for synchrotron imaging? <laughs> 